The following broadcast is brought to you by Public House Media. What's up, everybody? This is Christian Heimel, host of Press Row here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Press Row, where we talk about the biggest issues in sports with the analysts, experts, and reporters who cover them. No nonsense, hard-hitting interviews on the sports topics you're talking about. A new show comes out every single Thursday. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Press Row. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. There's a shadowy figure standing there in the distance. You don't see it, but you feel its presence. It walks toward you slowly. The crunch of dead brown leaves behind you choke you with claustrophobic fear. Mustering courage, you radically run as fast as you can, but it's no use. Your stomach forms a pit of fear so deep you can hear its echo. You trip. You begin trembling. Slowly you turn around and open your eyes, paralyzed by fear. It's staring into your soul. Beady dark eyes. Sinister smile. It's no ghoul. It's no demon. It's not even actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf. It's Willem Dafoe. Okay, but let's be real, he's a pretty scary looking dude. It's Halloween season, the spookiest time of the year, and for today's episode, we talk two fiendishly scary films, for two drastically different reasons. My name is Sam Kirby, reporting for Public House Media, and welcome to the first official episode of Cinema Stories with Sam Kirby, the show where we hang out, having a good time talking movie and TV news and reviews. This week we discuss the modern horror phenomenon that is The Conjuring and the new scarily realistic film, The Florida Project. So don't ghost out as we dive into these frightening flicks. I I apologize for that candy corny pun. I'm beginning to scare myself. I, I have a problem. Let's start with The Conjuring. So let me paint you a picture. It was my freshman year of high school. I first semi-saw the flick at a high school party. People were playing pool, couples were displaying a not okay amount of PDA, and I'm in the corner by myself, with a red Solo cup filled with Sunny D, eating a bag of Cheetos. Yes, I was that guy. And the movie was on in the background. So that was all of my knowledge of the movie, besides those creepy trailers with the Clap, clap. Going into the movie this week, I expected to be scared, and I was. Now, I took some statistics during the movie, as any normal moviegoer does. And there were two that really jumped out at me. The first being that there were roughly 16 terrifying jump scares, equally in about 16.5 times I ran to the bathroom crying. Now, that's important to note. Obviously, jump scares had its place in cinema before this film. The Conjuring used many jump scares to great commercial and critical success. It started the recent slew of films primarily featuring this scare tactic. It assisted in shaping the recent landscape of horror. Now, the second stat is that throughout the film, one dog dies and three pigeons die on screen. Who knows how many off screen? I think that we can all agree that that's too many CGI pigeons. PETA must have had a field day with this one. The actors and actresses all do a fine job. I actually believed the characters' reactions to the horror plaguing their lives, and I cared about them enough. Ed and Lorraine Warren, played by Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga, are likable as the paranormal detectives, though their interpersonal conflict didn't quite hit me emotionally. You really feel for this family, but there's nothing too gripping about the characters. But one can't really fault the movie too critically, since the characters play second fiddle to what we're all here for. No, not the pigeons. The scares. James Wan directs this film with quiet gravitas, and it's his direction that really elevates the flick. Wan does a great job of enveloping the audience in this disturbing retro atmosphere. At a lot of moments, the filter on the camera looks grainy, which further immerses the audience in this time. 
the music from the music box and the continuous tense silent moments dial the suspense up. There are a number of interesting camera moves tracking through the house that are very impressive on a technical standpoint. Mirrors are utilized throughout which really play well into the intense sequences. Juan really knows how to direct a creepy flick. Sadly, this movie suffers because of the films it's paying homage to. Though it's handled well, we've seen The Exorcist and other possession films like it. Take a classic horror film like John Carpenter's The Thing. That is something familiar, yet handled in a totally unpredictable way, and no one knew how that film would end. Though effective, The Conjuring is a bit predictable, which is never good in a horror movie. That being said, I was horrified like a small kitten. With effective scares, decent characters, and enthralling atmosphere and direction, The Conjuring is a strong horror film and a modern staple for the Halloween season. From one seemingly true story to hauntingly realistic cinema, let's take a look at The Florida Project. Now I think that anyone, me, you, the Pope, the homeless man across the street, anyone can review a film by analyzing five of the major aspects of filmmaking. The plot, the direction, the cinematography, performance, and character. Now let's talk about the plot. The Florida Project observes a handful of profanely colorful characters who reside in the dingy motels surrounding Florida's Disney World. The basic storyline follows a young mother named Haley, played by Bria Vinaite, struggling to keep her and her daughter Mooney afloat. The two reside in a rundown motel managed by a man named Bobby, played by Willem Dafoe. The film takes place largely from Mooney's point of view. It seems that not much really happens concerning the plot, but the film stands out in its execution. Now, a really talented director can take any script and run with it, delivering nuance and an overall effective film. Sean Baker takes this storyline and tackles it from the perspective of the motel dwellers, drowning the movie in realism. There's no unneeded exposition. The film isn't trying to twist or turn us or blow us away with set pieces. It plunges us into this fully realized environment with these fully realized characters. One can feel horrified by the way these characters act, and for a while, I was. Understanding the circumstances, the film begs questions of where do these characters fit into our society, and what makes a good parent? It's heartbreaking to see the young Mooney being raised by someone who's essentially just an older kid. The subject matter is so solemn and serious, but viewing it from the eyes of the potty-mouthed Mooney is what sets this film apart and makes it easier at times, yet harder at others to digest. This point of view is portrayed in the use of many low-angle shots looking up. Moments of dark comedy are often undercut by downright dark actions by Haley. There seems to be no real magic in these characters' lives. The film pays this off, though, in the final three minutes, offering a satisfying, yet unsatisfying conclusion to what essentially is a tragedy. These last moments are true whimsy, and it's one of the most effective scenes I've seen all year. The Florida Project is an example of terrific cinematography. The use of light is refreshing. There are bright colors sprinkled throughout the film, whether it be in an orange juice stand, the colors the kids wear, the neon associated with Haley, or the distinct color patterns in the motels, often symbolizing the naiveness of youth. If you're a film geek or love aesthetically proficient films, this is one for you. The director of photography, Alexis Zabe, really earns it with this film. Equally as strong are the characters and the performances. Across the board, the cast is terrific. Bria Vanite is so devilishly engaging in the film. A lot of her actions are disgusting and horrific, but she definitely sells it and delivers a performance that's going to get some award attention. The child actors, especially Brooklyn Price's Mooney, are shocking and effective in the film. The scene stealer is definitely Willem Dafoe. Playing the motel manager, he fosters a fatherly mentality, juxtaposing Haley's relationship with Mooney. He cares for the residents and their kids. He treats them with respect when others just brush them off. He understands where they're coming from, and no matter how many terrible things they do, he still cares for them. 
The scene with an older man walking near the kids is entertaining, dark, comedic, and gripping, all attributed to Defoe's performance. The cast is a dingy delight. The Florida Project is a trip into the dark, dirty corner of the United States. To great effect, the direction is unique, the cinematography is refreshing, and the performances are nuanced and gripping. The film asks profound questions about its subjects and parenthood without being preachy or ham-fisted. Some situations may prove to be too unsettling for some, and the pace may not work for general audiences, but this is a terrifically crafted film and is sure to get award recognition. I give it about four and a half out of five stars. It's a film that is sure to leave an impact on audiences. Now, since we discussed two flicks this week, next week we'll be discussing Stranger Things and Thor Ragnarok. I'm not going to lie to you, showbiz has been a bit of a terrifying place over the last couple of weeks. But now it's time to fill you in on all that's happening in the world of entertainment. These are today's cinema stories. According to an article on JoeBlow.com, the popular arcade game Contra is moving forward to become a live-action movie and TV series. The property was a shoot-'em-up game in a 1987 release by Konami. And I know everyone was clamoring for this one. Personally, I don't know much about the game, but apparently the lead characters of the game, Bill Reiser and Lance Bean, great names, were based off of Schwarzenegger and Stallone. So it can't be all that bad of an idea. Hopefully this one can break the streak of poorly received video game movies, both critically and commercially. No director is attached to the project yet. Screen Rant reports that Suicide Squad 2 may begin production in the spring of 2018. The film will be written and directed by Gavin O'Connor, who recently helmed the project's Warrior and The Accountant. Word is still out on if Jared Leto will return to his polarizing turn as the Joker. I'm not sure if he will because of his animosity towards the first film and the cuts the studio made, but we'll know for sure in the next coming months. No cast list has been officially announced. Anna Kendrick has posted a picture of herself dressed as Santa Claus's daughter. daughter. Did I did I read that right? Oh, yes, I, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, Disney's Nicole will see Anna Kendrick filling in for the jolly man in red as he's unable to deliver presents on Christmas. Nicole is set for a November 2019 release. You know what's really sad? Really scarily sad? What am I even saying anymore? We have to go. I want to give a huge thanks to everyone who tuned in today. And if you like the show, please go ahead and subscribe. And if you didn't like the show, please go ahead and subscribe. I really appreciate all of the love and support I've gotten so far. Thanks to Public House Media for having me and letting me do what I love. Talking movies. You can follow me on Twitter at Samuel underscore J underscore Kirby or Sam Kirby 17 on Instagram. And make sure to like Public House Media's Facebook page and tune into their other positive content. I want to give a special thanks to Purple Planet Music and We Are Sure for the music selections today. So everyone, go eat lots of candy, don't get chased by Willem Dafoe, and have a happy, happy Halloween. Bye!